morning, Rocky Peak. Hey, you ever have one of those days? Uh, I was just coming from the speaker's office backstage, have two big full cups of tea with honey in it, right? Put them on my iPad, walk, slide off all over me, right? So it's like, wow, what a start, you know, to this, uh, this service. But um, hey, I wanted to give you, if I met you, first of all, my name's Michael. I'm one of the pastors here, but uh, I wanted to give you an update, a uh, report on my hike last weekend. Remember, remember last week we had that? Okay, bottom line, extremely disappointing. I, so I, I, sure enough, I went out hiking in the rain, but as you know, like, I don't normally hike in the rain. In that one aspect of my life, I'm fairly normal. All right? So like, uh, normally when it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sunday is after church, I hike, but if it's raining, I don't go hiking, right? But this wasn't any normal day, right? This was going to be a hurricane. Uh, this was going to be a tropical storm. And so I'm visualizing 60 to 80 mile an hour winds, uh, a warm wind. I'm, I, I hike up steep mountains so I can imagine these uh, rivulets and streams flowing down the mountains and me fording these things. It was so boring. <laughs> it's like, all I did is get very wet, right? So anyway, but I survived. Thank you for your prayers. Appreciate it. Uh, that, uh, anyway, we're going to go to our time of teaching. And so I think Trish already mentioned that if you have your green and white message note sheet, go ahead and take that out. We'll definitely be using it. For those of you who are joining us online, a special welcome. And uh, on your screen, whether it's the top or the bottom, there's a a link you can click on message notes. You can get three different options of format. So if you guys are ready to go, uh, I'm ready to jump in. Let's, let's go. So Father, we just thank you so much for this incredible passage of scripture, kind of one of the Himalayan mountaintops of, of all your word. And uh, I just can't wait to get into it. Father, I just pray that today your Holy Spirit would be here. You'd empower me, uh, help me to remain in, in your zone as I teach. And I pray that for us as a church, God, we would gather around your word and as you say in the book of Revelation so many times, Jesus, let the church hear what the Spirit is saying to her. And we pray this in your name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Well, for those of you who are regular here at Rocky Peak, you know that typically when I start a message, I kick it off with a, an opening uh, story and that's going to become an illustration or, or part of the, the message later on. But today we've got so much to cover that I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, I know, I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, I actually had a story, but it just at the last, it's just like, there's too much. I can't put that in. Uh, and so, but, but today we're jumping into an amazing passage of scripture. It's truly, if you, if you were to think of like, if you were to Google top 10 mountaintops of the world, you know, you'd get the top 10, 10 high. If you Google the top mountaintops of the Bible, this would be one of them, I think. It's one of the most powerful uh, passages we're going to look at. So let me set it up. For those of you who are brand new, uh, this is a series. The series is called The Gospel of God. And what it is, is based on a kind of in-depth study of a letter from one of the key leaders of the early movement of Jesus. His name is Paul, we call him the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to a group of Jesus followers he's never met. They live in the capital city of the Roman Empire in Rome itself, about a million people. So we call this letter the letter to the Romans, right? And so as he opens up what this letter is about, he's explaining kind of the big picture story of God in our lives and our, in our universe. And he refers to this big picture epic story as the gospel of God, right? So today, for the first time, we're entering into the main body of the letter. So uh, uh, let me ask you, how many chapters does Romans have? Great. Three people have read it. That's good. They're, that's why we're doing a series. Okay, it's all right. No shame here. All right, there's 16 chapters. And so the main body of the letter starts at the, the middle of chapter one. It goes from the middle of chapter 15. And so today we're entering into the first major section of the body of the letter that starts at the middle of chapter one and goes through chapter four. And this is where we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish up at chapter four right before Christmas, all right? That's, that's where we're going. Um, and so, what, so what's Paul's doing in this, in, this, uh, in this first section is he's kind of laying out the big picture story of our race and why we actually need a gospel. And it's like, it's like if he's building a building, this is like the ground floor. And what's going to happen in this opening section is Paul is going to bring, uh, almost like a prosecuting attorney, he's going to be bringing the case on God's behalf against the human race. And we're going to see that why, like, why we are a race in rebellion against our creator, why we've all created high treason against our king, and why we're all under what Paul calls 
the wrath of God, apart from Messiah. Now, uh, we live in a day and age, we like to talk about the love of God, not so much the wrath of God, or in the Greek, the word is anger. It's a normal word for anger. But, um, but what we're going to see in this series is that the wrath or the anger of God is actually the flip side of the love of God and the goodness of God. That if you are truly completely good, if you're truly completely loving, then you're going to hate everything that is evil or destructive that tears apart what is good, everything that's a violation of the law of love. And so we're going to see today that the, when Paul talks about the wrath of God, the wrath of God is very different than the wrath of human beings. In fact, in James chapter 1, we're told that the anger of man doesn't accomplish the purposes of God. And so, so where, the anger of, where our anger tends to be very self-centered, maybe petty, uh, out of control, sometimes uh, unpredictable, God's anger is not like that. It's, it's more like his, um, his steadfast resistance against all that's evil. Right? And it's, uh, it's not like an angry parent coming off. It's, just, it's more like uh, his ultimate like no, no with a capital N to all this evil and destructive in the world. Right? And, so, and so we're going to be opening up today as Paul is going to be explaining, kind of bringing the first part of his indictment against the entire human race. And in this first section, which is the, first, the second half of chapter one, he's focusing in on Gentiles, right? That he's not focusing on Israel and Jews. He's focused on, on the general uh, kind of rebellion of the human race outside of Israel. He'll get to Israel when he gets to chapter two, which would be in a couple months. All right, so uh, if you have your uh, Bibles, you have your apps, let's go ahead and open up. Let's turn to chapter, uh, chapter one. We'll start at verse 18. And so he starts off and he says, the wrath of God. So we just talked about that. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. God's wrath is being revealed against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who catch this next line. This is key. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Right? So two things I want you to notice. First of all, let's set this up in context. If you were here last week, we looked at verse 16 and 17. In those two verses, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because in the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. And he said, the reason is powerful because in the gospel, catch this, the righteousness of God is revealed. How to be made right. Now, in your Bibles, if they're like my Bible, after verse 17, there's a break. You see that? And like in my Bible, there's a heading, God's wrath against sinful humanity. But in the Greek, of course, there is no break. And in verse 18, in the Greek, it starts with the word for, like as in therefore. So what he has just said, hey, the righteousness of God has been revealed in the gospel because, because of, and because of this, the, the wrath of God is being revealed. Like before he can tell us about how we're made right with God, he has to explain what's wrong with our race and why we, are, why we need a gospel at all. Why do we need a Messiah? And so he starts and he says, the wrath of God is being revealed. We'll come back to that later. But notice it's against all this uh, uh, godlessness and wickedness, who, people who suppress the truth. This is a key concept in this first chapter. We're gonna see it time and time again today where Paul's gonna say, and I want you to catch this, the core sin of our fallen human race, once we become fallen, is spiritual denial. Paul's gonna say this time and time again, that God has revealed to everyone in the human race, regardless, civilized, uncivilized, it doesn't matter what era, that God has revealed certain basic truths about who he is, about who we are, and about the path to life, what's right, what's wrong. And he says, the core sin of our race is instead of embracing that truth, we reject that truth because we don't like what it reveals and we don't like what it requires. And therefore, we intentionally turn away from the truth and we ignore the truth. In fact, he says in this verse, we suppress the truth. 
Why? So that we can go on and be our own gods and live our own way. And he's going to come back to that theme, the spiritual time and time again. This is the core of this passage, right? So let's move on. So the question is, well, okay, if God has revealed himself, well, how has he revealed himself? Um, He's not talking about the Bible here, right? The question is, how has God revealed himself to everyone? What Paul is going to say is that, that God has revealed himself through creation is just by looking at this amazing creation, you can, tell, you can learn a lot about the, like, if this is the design, you can create a lot about, learn a lot about the designer. So just by looking at creation, you can tell, man, there has to be a powerful being. This person has to be really brilliant. It's really like structured really well. Uh, this person must like beauty. Uh, this person, like, you can learn a lot about creation from the creator. And catch this, the most important part of creation the high point of creation is you and me. And so by just paying attention to ourselves and how we're wired, how we're designed, you can learn a lot about the creator. And even though we're a fallen race. And in fact, when we get to chapter two, Paul will say that God has written his moral law on the human heart. Now, this is really interesting because often you'll hear people say, all religions teach the same thing. If you've ever studied comparative religion, that is not true that they're completely different conceptions of who God is, what God is like, how we relate to God, what the big problem of the human race is, how you deal with guilt, the path to life. Huge disagreement, but here's the interesting thing. If you study all the major religions of the world, guess what? There is a ton of agreement about how we're to live. Basic right, basic wrong. And so Paul says, hey, God has revealed this to the human race. We just don't want to know it. And he says, okay, so he says, uh, verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, the beginning of time, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, what he's like, have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are what? Right, so, so here in this life, we're gonna have a lot of excuses. We get there and stand before them, uh, they're all going away. Like what we've been pushing down and denying our whole life is gonna be revealed and there's gonna be no excuses. And he says, for although they knew God, here he comes back to that theme. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, let God be God, in other words, nor give thanks to him. Like we wanted to be our own gods. So we're, we're gonna ignore this. And he says, but when they did that, when we reject the truth, this is what happens. Their thinking becomes what? Futile, which is a powerful word in the Greek. It speaks of confused or worthless. And he says, their foolish hearts were what? They're darkened. And so when we turn away from the truth, it's like the lights go out. Remember, in the Bible, when it talks about our heart, it's not talking just about our emotion. In the Bible, the heart is the center of your being. It's your, it's, your, it's your thoughts, it's your emotions, and it's your will. It's the core of who you are. So he says, hey, that when we choose to reject the truth about who God is, it's like the, the, the lights go out. And they, they, they go out intellectually, they go out spiritually, they go out morally. And he says, uh, and although they claim to be wise, well, we see that in our culture, don't we? Although they claim to be wise, they become what? Fools. Guess what the word is in Greek for becoming a fool? Moreno. (laughs) Enough said. All right. (laughs) Verse 23. Now he says, and here's what we do. We become fools. And so so what what Paul's going to say is once we reject the truth of God that's been revealed, the lights go out and catch this, this sets off what I'm calling today a process called the death spiral. And the first stage is when we reject the truth about God, we move into spiritual confusion about who God is. That leads to stage two, which is sexual confusion. And the reason is when you reject the truth about who God is, we're made in his image. Now we've lost the truth about who we are. 
And Paul says that begins to show our bodies begin to control our life. And since our strongest, one of our strongest passions is sexual passion, that what happens, we lose perspective. And so the second stage is sexual confusion. And then as we'll see, the final stage is social chaos and the breakdown of all human relationships. So we're gonna watch this cycle go, all right? So he says, first stage is spiritual confusion. So he says, uh, although they claimed to be wise, they became morons. And then verse 23. <laughs> Welcome to church, show your self-image. Uh, okay. 23. And so he says, and they exchanged. I want you to underline that word. If we have time today, it's gonna to become very important later. <laughs> uh, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings. And so think of them, when Paul's writing this Greco-Roman empire, think of all the gods. There's hundreds and thousands. There, most of them in the, for, for the Rome, Greco-Roman, they're like human beings, like Zeus and Apollo. They're just like, they're like projections of ourselves with all the sins and vices. If you've ever studied the Greco-Roman gods, I mean, they're committing murder, uh, incest, infidelity, uh, lying. They're just like, they're a projection of ourselves. Um, and we imbue them with certain powers. So we find something in creation and we, we begin to worship it instead of the creator. In Egypt, a lot of their gods of the time were like animals, were in the form of the image. So he says that here's what we did. He said, we exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. So he says, therefore... Catch this, God gave them over. I want you to underline that phrase. God gave them over. Paul is gonna use this phrase three times. It's very significant. So I want you to look back at verse 18. In verse 18, Paul said something really intriguing. He said, the wrath of God is going to be revealed. Is anyone paying attention? All right. No, it is being revealed. So one of the consistent teachings of Jesus, the New Testament, and Paul, by, we, we know that at the end of time, there's a final judgment when the wrath of God is going to be revealed against all the ungodlessness. We know that. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He says the wrath of God is being revealed right now, right here in real time, in our culture, right? In every human, and you say, well, it raises, well, in what way? How, what are you talking about? Well, in this verse, down in 24, he tells us. And he says, this is, he says, here's what happens. When a, when a person or a culture rejects the truth that's been revealed and they choose to embrace a lie, God says, okay, if you don't want the truth, I'll give you over to the lie. But since the lie is a worldview that's not in alignment with reality, you're gonna pay the price. So for example, you don't have to believe in the law of gravity. You can say, I don't believe in that law. But I, I'm pretty sure if you jump out of a 10-story building without a parachute, you're still gonna die, right? And so God says, okay, you don't wanna embrace the truth that there's a creator. You wanna create the... You don't embrace the truth, it's more core moral code. You don't want to do that. You can, but you're going to pay the consequence because your choices are no longer going to be in alignment with the way the real world works. And what's going to happen is you're going to lose your humanity along the way. It's going to lead to a degradation, a loss of your humanity. You become more like the animals not create like to be like God. We're more like the animals. And so he says, so the first stage of this is sexual confusion. That when we, we reject God, right? It leads first to spiritual confusion of who God is, but then it's gonna lead to sexual confusion, the next stage. He says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. So let's talk about this. So we're going to be talking a lot about human sexuality in this series. Uh, 
this, in this, this passage, we're going to spend five more weeks in this passage. Right? So we're going to come back. But just for today, as we take the big picture of this whole passage, I just need to throw this out, that when you come to the Bible from Genesis, from Jesus, from the New Testament writers, the apostles, it's all the same, that God has a vision for our human sexuality. That, that human sexuality, sexual relation is designed to unite and to bond one man with one woman, only two sexes, right, only two genders, to unite one man with one woman for a lifetime of love and commitment, what we call marriage, and that through that to create a safe and stable environment to raise up the next generation and to help them flourish. That's what sexuality is about, right? So in, in the Bible, any kind of sex outside of that is a violation of the created order. And as a result, it's not alignment with reality. And what we, we think it's leading to freedom, it actually leads to the loss of our humanity. And so Paul's going to begin to talk about those. So he says, so this is what happened. You reject the truth. It starts with spiritual confusion. Now we lose con confusion about ourselves, And first of all, we lose confusion about our bodies and especially our sexuality. And so he says, uh, so it starts with uh, just sexual impurity in general, like sexual immorality and impurity. And, and then notice he comes back to the source, the reason again, verse 25, the reason for all this downward spiral is that they exchange the truth of God for a lie. So underline that word exchanged again. Again, we'll come back to it. They, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. So when we reject the knowledge of God, we're still hardwired to be worshipers. So if we can't worship the real God, we'll find something in creation we will worship, who is forever praised, amen. And so now Paul's gonna say, not only do we fall into sexual confusion, we actually fall into sexual perversion. And he says, because of this, notice what he says, God gave them over to shameful lusts, and he's going to move on to talk about homosexuality now, same-sex relationships. He says, even the women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones, and the same way, the men abandoned natural relations. We'll, see, we'll look at this later in coming weeks, but what he's saying here is by nature. In other words, nature is designed, God's design, with uh, women, and were inflamed with lust for one another. He said, men committed shameful acts with other men and they received in themselves the due penalty for their error. So we can reject kind of God's design for human sexuality and we can actually feel free. Just like a drug addict using drugs feels free. But the result, the, the reality is we are, are, we're losing our humanity in the process. We're losing who we're created to be. We're losing increasingly the glory of God that we're designed to have. Now, so now we've gone through the first two stages. We reject the truth. That leads to spiritual confusion. We lose the truth about God. We lose the truth about ourselves in terms of our bodies, who we are. And so we go to sexual confusion, but now we move to the final stage. We're gonna lose now perception of our minds. And this is gonna to lead to social chaos and the breakdown of human relations. So he says in verse 29, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. You see how he keeps coming back to that. He says, so God gave them over to what? A depraved mind. So he just talked about a depraved bodies and sexual morality. Now he says, but now he's gonna give them to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to have been done. And they become filled, not just a little bit, but filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. And now he's gonna give us some examples. We come to one of Paul's kind of long sin lists. And if you're like me, it's always tempting when you get to these sin lists, almost just to skim by or, or uh, you know, not really think them through, kind of skip over. But here's what I want you to catch. That Paul's gonna give us a list of attitudes and actions that are expression of our fallen human nature that destroy human relationships. And so as we walk through this list, I want you to picture this, not just as a list, but picture a marriage that has these characteristics. 
Picture a church that has these characteristics. Picture a team at work that has these. Picture a government that has these. Picture a business that has these. And I want you to, to fix one of those in your mind, one or two. Maybe it's a family. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's an extended family. And, and let's just kind of, with that lens, let's say what happens to, those, to human relations when these actions and attitudes enter in. And so he says, in, verse, uh, in the middle of verse 28, they're full of envy. Hey, have you ever been part of an extended family that's full of envy? Um, <laughs> They're full of murder, of strife, of deceit. Have you ever been in or watched a marriage where there's a lot of deceit and what that does to a marriage? Uh, What about malice? Have you ever worked on a team at work where uh, a department, there's just a lot of malice in there? They're gossips. Have you ever been part of a life group? No raised hands. Have you ever been part of a life group? Uh, You've been part of a church where gossip, is, has been unleashed. What, what happens to that group? What, what happens to any community where gossip becomes the norm? They're slanders, they're God-haters, they're insolent, they're arrogant, they're boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, loyalty, no love, no mercy. I love how the 1984 version of the NIV, uh, New International Version, is which is my favorite. Um, there on your note sheet, I put this one verse, how they summarize verse 31. Look how they summarize it. I wish they'd left it like this. It really kind of captures the cadence of the Greek as well. But it says, they are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Does that kind of remind you of kind of where our culture is going right now. And then he goes on and he says, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things, like what he's been describing the whole chapter, the sexual sin, these other relational sins, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. So this is the final stage of a culture in decline where not only do we do these things and then we're embarrassed or we hide it, we're ashamed, but we now begin to take these actions and attitudes and we begin to, we boast about them. I think immediately of Pride Month, which is, it was really, all that is, is it's a month to celebrate sexual immorality of all kinds. But it's not just sexuality You see cultures in which like racism is celebrated, right? You see uh, cultures in which violence is celebrated. Um, uh, Just like like a mic, I think of gang, the gangs and violence and all, but it's it's for all of us. I think of some of our TV shows that we watch and sometimes, this is not like a shame you think, but hey, are you thinking about what you're putting in your mind? I mean, we watch shows like Bachelor and things like just celebrating immorality, celebrating sexual sin, right? right? And, and so we, even as Christians, we get caught up in this and we kind of lose our perspective, right? And Philippians talks about, think about those things that are pure, that are right, that are good. And sometimes we're putting garbage in and we wonder why garbage comes out, right? And so, so hey, it's not a heavy, like, shame, but, hey, are you thinking about what you're thinking about? And so we come to this thing where we have TV shows that celebrate backstabbing, uh, malice, jealousy. And and these are top-rated shows. We'll tune in to watch them. Paul says this is what happens when a culture rejects the truth about the creator. It's a downward spiral. And it starts with spiritual confusion It leads to sexual confusion and finally to social chaos. And now it's interesting because, of course, as Paul's writing this, he's imagining some objections to this. You know, Paul's, uh, he's teaching the gospel everywhere and he teaches it publicly. And of course, there's people raise their hands, they're gonna object. And so in Romans, we're gonna watch him deal with these objections. And when we get to chapter two, there's gonna be people that say, hey, Paul, I get that. You're kind of condemning like human culture in general, but I live by a different standard. I'm a Stoic philosopher. I'm this way. I live by a higher standard. Or that you're a Jew. 
And you say, Paul, I get that. I'm, go get those Gentiles. In fact, this passage we just read is very similar to many kind of diatribes against the Gentiles for their, uh, their, uh, uh, Im- for their idolatry that leads to immorality that were, were common in Jewish writings of the time. And so you have, you have Jews going, Paul, that's, yeah, go get them, Paul. That's them, right? But it's not us. Like, we're God's chosen people. Like, we have the law of God. We, we, don't, we don't do immorality like that. We don't do idolatry like that. And Paul's going to say, yeah, yeah, I get that. I'll get to you in just a minute. And so with this, Paul, Paul gives his opening statement is he brings the evidence to bear against the rebel race. And he says, this is the story of our race. Now, here's what I want to do. As I mentioned, we're going to spend five more weeks in this this passage. Uh, There's so much to tackle here, not only to understand the big picture and what God's saying in the gospel, but to understand what's happening in our culture. And so we're, we're going to come back to it. But today, I just want to highlight three big picture truths, life lessons that flow out of this. And to get Adam, I'm going to give two straightforward uh, in the next section and then come back at the end and ask one key question to, to, to bring in the, third, the third, uh, third main point and make it really practical. So there in your notes, you have a section called The Gospel of God, The Death Spiral. So, so two big truths. Let's jump in. Let's, number one, the first, very simple, but let me unpack it. One big picture principle. Remember, Paul's laying out the story of our race. This is the gospel of God. And the first thing he wants to understand is the core problem of our race. The core problem is spiritual. He says that, hey, the core problem of the human race is spiritual. That we are a race that we have rejected the truth that God has revealed to everyone. It doesn't matter what civilization. It doesn't matter in civilization, outside of civilization. He's revealed to every person certain truths about who he is, who we are, how we're to relate to him and one another. And God has written those on the human heart and he's revealed them to creation. But the reality is as a race, we reject the truth because we don't like what it reveals. We don't like what it requires. And that leads to this downward spiral of creating gods in our own image to let us do what I want, spiritual confusion. It leads into confusion about who we are. You see it in our bodies, sexual confusion. And finally, you see it in our minds with social chaos. Now, this is very important because if you were to ask people in our culture today, what is the problem with the human race? Everyone agrees the human race is screwed up. But like, what's the problem? What's the source of our problems in our own personal life? What's the source of our problems in culture in general? And here are some of the answers. There'll be many people that would say the core problem of the human race is a lack of education or a lack of the right kind of education. There are others that will say the core problem of the human race is economic. Think of a Karl Marx. The core concept of Marxism is that some people own the means of production and other people don't. And the people that own the means of production oppress those who don't. And so if you just have a revolution and those who don't have take down those who do have and we redistribute everything, it will lead to the golden age of humanity. Everyone will flourish. That's an economic solution. What's the core problem of the human race? It's poverty. It's economic, right? There's others who will say, no, the core problem of the human race is the breakdown of the family. We've had a breakdown in the family. Marriages aren't together. Uh, Children grow up in in homes without fathers and so on. Others will say, hey, the core problem of the human race is the government. If we just drain the swamp, you know, uh, just get the right candidates, whoever we we think that is. Whoever the right candidate, if we just get our people in office, then, then that's the solution. Uh, Others would say, hey, the problem is racism. And if we just resolve the problem of racism, uh, others would say the problem are drugs and alcohol tearing our nation apart. If we just stop those influx of drugs, we get proper drug treatment, then then, then society would vote. Others would say, this is a big one. The biggest one in our culture right now, the solution is identity politics. The concept that the core problem of the human race is you have haves and have nots. 
And those who are in a position of power, they create narratives to keep themselves in power and oppress others. And so the solution is to tear down those in power and redistribute power. And that's the core problem of the human race. Now, here's what I want to tell you. There's, I believe there's some truth in every one of these explanations. But what Paul would say, these aren't the source of the problem. They are the symptoms of the problem. These are the results of a race that has rejected the truth about God, the truth about ourselves, the path to life, and as a result of rejecting the truth, the lights go out. So we create our own worldviews of what, how life works. They don't work. They don't align with reality. And so what do we keep? We just keep pouring more money in to whatever our solution is, thinking that will solve the problem. It's not, because the core problem of the human race is spiritual. And it's because of this rejection of the truth that Paul says, that's why we're under the wrath of God. And he says, that is why our lives and culture get so messed up. And catch this, that is why the Messiah had to come because there are no solutions rising up from this fallen race. If there's a solution, it's got to be top down. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, number two is that the death spiral is real. So today, I've kind of laid out what Paul says, hey, hey there is this, this death spiral that happens when we reject the truth um, our, uh, the lights go out, and it starts us in this process of spiritual confusion, leads to sexual confusion, and all the problems that come with that, by the way, and then, and then it leads to social chaos and the breakdown of human culture, society. And I want to I wanna highlight a couple things that Paul isn't saying, all right? He's not saying that everyone commits every one of these sins. Right? Um, what he's saying is that in a culture... In any culture, it doesn't matter that we, we, re, we all reject the truth about God in our own way as a culture, and that, that as a result, these are the types of sins that characterize human culture. It doesn't matter. Pick a culture. You're going to find them all there. Right? And so secondly, I've, as I've walked us through this passage, I've sort of given the impression that this is a linear process. This spiral is a linear process. First, you reject the truth about God, and then, and then that leads to spiritual confusion. And then, sec then the second stage comes, and there's, and there's some truth to that, but this really is more organic. That the more we, when we, we reject the truth about God, it's gonna affect us uh, in every way. Uh, it's gonna affect us sexually, it's gonna affect us socially, it's going to come together. But there is a sense, I think, which there is a, uh, like a linear uh, trend of this. And catch, the more a culture gets away from the creator and the, the truths of God revealed in our lives about moral, morals and things like that, the more, we, the more we stray, the deeper the spiral goes and the faster. Like, let me give you an example. One of the things I've studied a lot is the history of the Roman Empire. And uh, one of the interesting things is the Roman Empire, when it started, uh, this was before there were Caesars, so B.C. Come on. Before that, there really were some high noble values. Now, there were fallen culture, like everyone else, but there were really some noble values that, that if you were to read about these, these values, you'd say, that's a noble value. Right? But what you find as Rome progresses and as their prosperity increases those values begin to go bye-bye. And a new set of values come in, materialism, wealth, sexuality, and so on, and the culture changes, which leads to the fall of the Roman Empire. And you can also see the reality of this death spiral in our culture right now in real time. And here's, I want, I want to take you on a little journey of our culture, okay? So when our, when our country started, even before that, you know, you go back to the first settlements and so on, that in our country, there, that, that the vast majority of people uh, embraced what we would describe as a Judeo-Christian worldview. Right? 
Now, I want to be very careful. When I say that, I don't mean that most people were Christians in our sense of the word. But their worldview came out of the scriptures. There is a real God, right? So they, they may be a deist, and they don't think he personally intervenes. They may be something else, but there was a sense that there is a creator, and there is an order in creation. And this is why when you read our constitution or declaration, these references to God are made and all men are created equal. See, where did the, there was no other culture in the history of the world that had ever been formed that way. But that came from the scriptures, you see? That came from the Judeo-Christians. There, there is a God and there is a moral order in the universe and they all assumed that. But along the way, the, the dominant worldviews of our, of our culture began to change. And when, if you were here in January, we did a series on worldview. And we talked about this, you know, what is a worldview? A worldview is your big picture view of reality. Every worldview has to answer some basic questions. How did we get here? What's the meaning of life? Is there a God? Is there not a God? If there is a God, what's that God like? Um, how should we live? What does human flourishing look like? What happens after death, right? So we went from a Judeo-Christian basic worldview. We, we went to, we began to embrace as a culture what we call scientific materialism. Right? So I'd say most people today in our culture probably hold to a mixture of three worldviews. It would be a mixture of scientific materialism, postmodernism, with a dash of new age spirituality. Right? Now, those three worldviews are all mutually incompatible, but that doesn't bother us. We just mix them together. Right? You kind of pick and choose, right? So, so let's talk about that. So let's talk about a scientific materialist worldview. So what is that worldview? It says, well, everything we see, everything we experience, everything in the cosmos is physical. It's made out of material stuff. There's, there's no such thing as a God. There's no such thing as spirits, that there's only material things. And that everything we see in the cosmos, including you and I, are the result of billions of years of random accidents. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there is no God. And if there is no God, there's no absolute truth. And if there is no God, there's no absolute moral standard, things, things that are always right, always wrong, that morals just become a reflection of a culture's opinion. This is what you often hear, that they're a social construct. It's just that society has created a system, and we say, this is what we think is right, and this is what we think, but there's no absolute. And so if a culture changes their mind, they just change their mind. There, there's no absolute standard. And it also means there is no meaning, there is no purpose in life. You may choose to believe you have a purpose, but you're the result of billions of years of accidents. And so, so we begin to buy into scientific material. This is the dominant worldview, isn't it? This is what's taught in all of our universities. It's what's assumed in documentaries. It's what's taught to our elementary kids. This is a dominant worldview. But along after that, it's so depressing that the postmoderns rise up, right? And so they say, hey, well, if that's true, then, hey, let's point these things out. There is no meaning. There is no right. There is no wrong. And so all that's left is your opinion versus my opinion. And so why should your opinion have any more value than my opinion? And all it comes out with is that it's just your power against my power. And the story that you're telling, the narrative you're telling, whatever that is, that is just your story to keep you in power and to oppress me in my power, which leads us to identity politics. And so we have a culture today that can't even talk intelligently about these issues because if I, as a Christian, even start to talk to you about someone who's a different thing, they'll say, that's your narrative to keep you in power. And, I, and so, so what do you do? You just cancel me. There's no room for debate. There's no room for discussion. It's just power versus power. 
And who is going to have the power? Which leads us to a culture like the end of chapter one. Ruthless, senseless. We don't even care about the truth. All we care about is my position. So I will twist news. I will shape information. Why? There's no such thing as right or wrong. It's just, this is what I think is right. And I will shift reality to advance my point of view and increase my power. So what I want you to catch is this is not just like theology. This is reality. What we're experiencing right now, the confusion, the chaos in our culture is happening because we have been down the death spiral. We rejected the truth of God that's revealed in creation. We've rejected the truth of God because of that. If we're all random, there is no moral code written in our heart. We've rejected that. And the end result is all we're left with is power. And we truly believe as a culture, if we just fight one another long enough, the world will be a better place. It's like professing ourselves to be wise, we become fools. So this death spiral is very real. Now, number three. This number three is really, I'm going to turn it into a question. But I wanted to highlight one other key, key principle that comes out here. But I want to get out. I want this one to be super practical. And not just be observing our culture, but hey, for our lives as followers of Jesus, uh, what do we want to take away today? So I'm going to give you the question. It's a very simple question, but I'm not going to ask you to answer it right away. I need to unpack it a little bit, but the question goes like this. Do you have any idols? So here's what Paul says today. We reject the truth about God. It leads to this downward spiral. First stage is spiritual confusion. And he says, we don't like, we don't want to, we don't want to relate and submit to the real God and honor and glorify. So we're going to create our own gods. But I want you to catch this. What he says is that because we are spiritual beings, because you and I are created in the image of God, we're created for a relationship with God. We were created to rule for God. That's who we are. We were created, you and I are hardwired for worship. It's part of our spiritual DNA. And so what happens when we reject the true God, you know what we do? We have to find something in creation to make our God. And this is what Paul says in Romans 1.25. He says, they exchanged the truth, underline that exchange, right? We'll come back. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. So, so what, like in Paul's time, like idolatry is all over. It's, a, it's woven into the fabric of everyday life. There's literally thousands of gods in the Roman Empire. Gods for everything, right? And so in Paul's day, what do they do? They, they project their humanity into like a big humans. The gods are like a big us. All the same things that we do. All the same fallenness. So those gods can't really condemn us for doing that. We're just like them, right? So... So now we have, but then we put on these gods, we make them the gods of our biggest desires. So we have God of war, Mars. We worship him because we want to win in the battle. We've got a a God of love, Aphrodite. We want to have a great love life. And so we're going to worship Aphrodite. We have a God named Asclepius because we want to be healthy. And so we're going to worship him so we get health. And so basically... We, we kind of come, what we think is the good life, we put it on our gods, and now we're going to worship them in the hopes that they will give us what we want. Now, here in our Western culture, for most of us, we don't have like literal idols in our house. Um, some of us do, like over, like over where you shave or the mirror, or whatever. You know, you have a picture of the truck and everything. You know, you know. Then we bring Jesus in. Jesus, will you give me my idol? Uh, But we don't have literal idols, right? But we often fall into the same trap, even as believers. You stop and think, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to be a Christian? At the core, it means we have come back to our creator, that we have rejected this rebellion, And we've come back under our creator through the Messiah. 
to enter into right relationship that we do want to praise him. We do want to thank him. We do want to glorify him. By definition, a Christian is someone who's laid down their idols. And yet we all struggle with this, right? Because we have this fallen human uh, nature, Paul calls the flesh. When we all struggle with this, right? We, we all are tempted at times to go back and to make our life something in creation, our top value, our ultimate value, and to worship it, to build our lives around this, because we really believe that if we can just get that thing, we'll be happy. Now, this is very interesting. Remember, I want to just do a quick sidebar here. Very interesting. So remember, chapter one, Paul's talking to Gentiles, right? He's not going to talk to Jews until chapter two. But for those who have eyes to see, he's dropping hints that your time is coming. And one of the ways he does that is he uses this phrase a couple times, they exchanged. Remember that? And there are two passages in the Old Testament that use that language. One is in Psalm 106, talking about at Mount Sinai, when they exchanged the glory of God for the golden calf. And the second one I put on your note sheet in Jeremiah 2, where God comes to Israel, and it's a time when they're full of idolatry. And this is what he says there on your, on your note sheet. He says, my people, God says, my people, Israel, have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Catch that phrase, they've exchanged. It's not by accident that Paul's using this phrase, they exchanged. He's, he's, he's kind of, it's like a shot over the bow that, that Jews, you may be looking at this Gentile, and you know, go get them, Paul. But there's kind of like, you come from a nation that has a long history of idolatry. You're made of idol worshiping stuff. And maybe you no longer worship idols and you don't, you don't participate in this kind of sexual sin or homosexuality. Yes, you're very proud of that, but you come from the same stock and you have your own way of exchanging the glory of God for worthless idols. And let me tell you, as people of God today, followers of Jesus, we can do that too, can't we? We, we all have this natural tendency. It's part of our fallen human nature to take something in creation to make it our top value in life, to structure our life around it, because we believe if we achieve it, we receive it, we attain it, that we will be happy. So there in your note sheet, I've done this before, but there in your note sheet, I, I, there's a section called the seven Ps. You might want to write in the word of idolatry, the seven Ps of idolatry. There's nothing magic about the seven. Uh, it's just a biblical number. Uh, <laughs> There could be nine, there could be come up, come up other piece, but this is just, what I want to do is I just want to walk you through an like seven types of gods. So we can take something in creation and catch this. It's something that's a good thing. These seven things I'm going to highlight, they're good things. Here's the thing. When we take a good thing and we make it the ultimate thing, it becomes a bad thing. And it sets us on the downward death spiral. We begin, instead of moving deeper into the life that Jesus came to give us, remember, I've come to give you life and life to the full. Instead of moving deeper, we start losing that life. We move back to the death we came from. And so I want to run through these seven. And here would be like a thought experiment for you. What I want you to do is we run through, I want you to ask the question, which of these idols am I most drawn to, most tempted to bow down to? So let's just run through them. So I'm going to, very quickly, number one is people. Um, for many of us, uh, the biggest temptation in our life is to make a person or certain kind of relationship our ultimate highest value. Like in, in American culture, one of the greatest gods today, one of the greatest idols of our race is romance. It's in all of our movies, not all of our movies, but so many of them, it's in almost all of our songs, and the message is constant. If you can just find love, you found the meaning of life. But it doesn't have to be romance. It could be, uh, hey, if I just have this friend, or uh, if, we just, if I can just get married, or if we just have children, we just have a healthy family. And this becomes like our highest goal, right? That we believe, if we attain this kind of personal relationship, that we'll be happy. The second P is a P of pleasure. 
course, this is one of the greatest gods of our, of our uh, age, of our culture, uh, especially with sexuality. Constantly the message is, hey, the secret of life is having good sex, and here's five ways to have better sex. It's everywhere, right? It's, it's seen as like, this is why, the, can you, you look at our sexual culture, it's like, this is my identity. This is the core of who I am. How could I deny it? It's the most important thing about me is my sex, my sexuality. So for us, it's one of the biggest idols of our race, but it doesn't have to be just sex, drugs, rock and roll, that kind of pleasure. It could be other kinds, right? I'm going after the good life. I want fine wine and I want great dinners and I want you know, nice clothes, they just feel right. And I'm a, it can be different levels of pleasure, but we make, uh, like, like Paul talks in Philippians 3, they, their, their, uh, uh, their bellies are their pleasure. Right? The, or their bellies are their gods, rather. A third P would be the P of prosperity. This is a huge God in our culture. Hey, I got to make a certain amount of money. I got to live in a certain amount of neighborhood. I have a certain kind of clothes. I need a certain amount of security. And I want you to remember what Jesus said about this. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. And he went on and said, you cannot serve God and money. Now, why does he say money? Well, because money, prosperity, has always been one of the greatest gods of the human race. But I want you to catch this. He could have put anything else in there. Because the reality is, I want you to catch it, we can't have two ultimate values. The sooner they're coming to collision, one, you have to have one value that rules them all. And the question is, what is that value? Whatever that is, that's your God. Like if your top value in life is to know to love and to please Jesus, that's the way it should be. If there's anything else that matters more to you than knowing, loving, and pleasing Jesus as a top priority of your life, you got an idol. And you'll never experience the life he came to give you because you're worshiping a worthless idol. You're not following Messiah. So prosperity. Uh, Next God is God of popularity. For some of us, we struggle with this. Our deepest fear is we won't be loved and we won't be popular. And so just being in the in crowd or being popular. And so what, it comes, what happens is when we have, we're called to stand up for Jesus, we, we can't do this because we can't be persecuted for Jesus because, because our, ta- our God is popularity. You know? And I'll believe in Jesus as long as it doesn't cost me anything. But if it's gonna cost me popularity, then I'm not gonna follow Jesus because my God is popularity. That's what matters most to me. The next God is the God of position. And of course, this varies from person to person. It could be, hey, if I can just make the team, if I can get into this right college, if I get in this career, if I get this position, if I can rise to this, but there's certain position in life that we feel like, if we could just attain that, Next P is a P of power. One of the greatest gods of the human race is power. In fact, money, sex, and power, three probably biggest. Money, sex, and power. But, you know, power motivates, right? Like, you look at all the history of our race and all the wars. Like, follow it out. Usually, wars are because of power. Someone wants more power. World War I, World War II. Right now, Russia and Ukraine. Like, what's it about? But it doesn't just happen at a global scale. This is part of our human nature that for many of us, we want to be the top dog. We want to be in charge. We want to tell people what to do. We want control. You think of the narcissist and then narcissism growing in our culture at rapid rates. And why? Because we want to be in control. So a, a wife wants to control her husband or the husband wants to control his wife. It can happen at any level. I want to be in control and have the power. The last P is a P of pursuit. This is sort of a a wide category because it's just, there's so many different things that we can pursue in life. If I could just skydive, if I just go skiing every weekend, uh, sports, I mean, sports becomes my pursuit. Video games, that's the, this is the thing for me. Nothing gets in the, I don't have time to spend with Jesus, but I'll spend four hours on video games, right? It's like that we, uh, kids sports, right? Kids sports can become this idol. We've talked about this before, but we raise our kids and we schedule our whole lives 
around our kids' sports. And we're like, if there's time and if it works, we'll get them to church, we'll get them to small group. But the most important thing is we get a scholarship to college so our whole life and family life is wrapped around getting a sport so we can get a scholarship. And then we can understand when our kids get the scholarship and go to college, they walk away from Jesus. It's because, hey, if you want your kids to walk with Jesus, and I know there's no guarantee, but if you want to walk your kids to walk with Jesus, I'll tell you the most important thing. You walk with Jesus. Amen. You walk with Jesus because kids watch what you do, not what you say. And we've been telling them our whole lives, hey, we'll squeeze church in, we'll squeeze this, got to get the scholarship. What we're telling them is that Jesus is nice, but what's really important in life is getting a good education and a good job, and we will sacrifice anything to make that happen. Men and women, this is what a false God is. A false God is anything we put above knowing, loving, and pleasing Jesus as our top priority. And whatever we put above it, that is our God. And you know what? When we put something good into the position of the ultimate, it leads to the downward spiral. Men and women, this is what Jesus came to tell us. There is nothing in creation that can satisfy the deepest need of the human heart for a relationship with the creator. You were designed for him. What did Jesus say? I came to give you life and life to the full. And then what he said, this is eternal life that they know you and they know me who you sent. It's this relationship with a God who created you is the only thing that can satisfy the deepest desire of the human heart and lead you to life. And anytime we put anything, person, pursuit, power, position, pledge, anything above that, then we are not following the Messiah on the path to life. We have gone back to our worthless idols that lead to death. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Well, Father, we just, I, I just come to this passage, Lord, you just know it's just so powerful. It, it's just so incredibly brilliant. As Paul lays out the story of our race and what we have done, we've rebelled against our creator and that's the story. That's why we're under the wrath. That's why our lives are messed up. That's why culture is messed up. And that's why Messiah came to bring us back into relationship with our creator and to lead us in the path of life. As we strip off our idols, we embrace truth and the truth sets us free. And so Lord, as we come to this moment, as we sing this beautiful song about re-surrender, may this be a moment that we're just so super open to you, whatever you're saying to us right now. And there's an area of our life that we know, we know is out of line, that we say yes to you and then just ask you, as we leave today, okay, so how do I realign my life so that you are my true God and I've not exchanged you for worthless idols? We pray this in your name, amen.